So the, the, the question is how to lead your organization's AI transformation and, and how do we skip the platform trap? And that's a very long, boring title. So I thought, can we make it slightly more fun? So maybe it's Dr. Copilot or how I learned to stop worrying and loved AI. Um, we'll see. So uh, I'm Rasmus. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Been there for about a decade. Um, you can hit me up there if you want. Um, and also, as I usually say, there's, there's a disclaimer here. The, the opinions here are my own. They might coincide with the opinions of my employer, but that was not the goal of this. Um, so uh, yeah, don't go out and say Microsoft says. But you can totally say Rasmus from Microsoft says, and I will stand up to that. Um, also, uh, product placements may occur. Sorry about that. Um, but it's, um, a, there are a suite of products I know about, so I'm not going to speak about the competitors. Um, so if you're like, yeah, that's the Microsoft thing, I know. Um, but it's not going to be a sales talk. Okay. So, um, and also another disclaimer, this talk was written and conceived without the user copilot. Um, because I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, that uh, the creative bit is the best place to use AI. Yeah? Real quick, can we dis and big way Copilot here? Because we're all using the same name, and I was talking about GitHub Copilot, and I think you may be... Yeah, but so Microsoft Copilot, ChatGPT, something. Okay. Right, right. So, um, yeah. So what is the AI, that AI thing? And um, what are we racing towards, and why? We're all hearing about this AI all the time. And walking through the office, it's copilot, 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 copilot. Shut up! So um, it would be nice if we could sort of, yeah. So Praben did a little bit about disambiguating what AI is and what we can use it for. Um, but there's also a lot of FOMO in this, right? Have you got FOMO in AI? Like everybody else is using it. Why, why am I not? Why am we not? I mean, if we don't adopt AI, we're going to die. Um, so, um, I'm not entirely sure of that. Um, there's a probability if you adopt AI, you die, at least if you're driving a Tesla. Um, <coughs> so, um, and there's also a lot of FUD. We also talked about fear, uncertainty, doubt. Uh, there was a question for Carl, right, where, um, um, where are they taking my code? And what about my IP? And, and who's stealing what? And um, yeah, um, if you read the New York Times, we stole a lot. Um, but that's still, opinions are still out. So we don't really know. Um, and GDPR and data sovereignty and all that stuff. So um, but there's something to deal with there. Um, but there's also a what do I adopt and, and what do I allow? But the, I think the data problem has always, always been there. If you don't have control of your data, if you don't have to classify your data, well, who are you serving it up for? So um, that problem should have been solved years ago anyway. Um, speaking with a lot of enterprises, it has not been solved. So um, it's still a thing. Okay, so AI transformation, what is that then? And we're all talking about transformation. And, and again, uh, before it was co-pilot all the time at the office, they were talking about digital transformation. And we ought to do digital transformation and more products and, and everything should be more digital. Um, it just turns out it's really about transformation. It's not buying a tool or uh, getting new technology, it's about transforming people. Right? And um, that's the thing that's hard to buy. Um, here's a definition for it. AI transformation is the process of implementing AI and machine learning to improve how businesses operate and develop strategy. It often requires changes to business, processes, organization structure, and employee roles. Wait a minute. So I can't just buy it, I, 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 it requires change. So the thing is, if you don't change your organization to adopt AI, I'm gonna throw in a law here. Anybody care to take a guess on which law? There you go. So um, yeah, back in 67, Melvin Conway said, organizations which design systems in a broad sense are constrained to produce designs that mimic their way of communication. So if you don't change, what you get is a technically backed slower version of yourself. So you can't just buy a new tool. And as a manager, I mean, who are you of like top manager things? You can't just throw an all hands meeting and you can't just throw a PowerPoint at the board. There's, there's something else here. You can't just say our strategy is you really have to lean in and do something. 
And very much, very importantly, the strategy must be driven by business outcome. It's not about, ooh, shiny new thing. We need to adopt AI. Why do you need that? What kind of business outcome are you aiming for? What do you want from this? Um, and also, you must understand the capabilities. Like, what can AI do for you? What can AI do for your customers, for your employees, for your business? Um, before we adopt this thing, I mean, yeah, do, do some research, right? What, what is actually we're trying to do? Uh, before we set up this billion dollar project to, to make AI change the thing, I think we should figure out why we're doing this. And then you might be thinking, as a manager in an enterprise, as you usually do, it's got something to do with IT. Let's make the IT organization figure it out. Right, they, they can figure it out. They, they deal with IT, right? Um, so purple and mock quotes. Um, let the, so, so they will say, let's form an AI center of excellence, oh, missing a word there, which can govern AI and build compliant AI, an AI platform for everyone can use. So who of you have a cloud center of excellence in your business? Only one? Yeah, okay. We're sorry we came up with that idea. That's terrible. Um, um, so, um, but the thing is, they want to build a platform. They're like, we have to govern AI. We have to make sure that before we hand it to the people, we have to have control of it. Um, there's at least two problems here, like possibly 17,000. Um, but first one is 80% of the businesses I work with are at any given time, 80% done with the next platform that's gonna solve all the world's problems. At any given time. And you're like, when does it reach 100? It never does. Right? At some point, some manager gets pissed that it hasn't reached the milestone that we agreed on in the planning six years ago, that they're gonna fire the manager of the platform and introduce a new manager to the same platform and say, you make it work, possibly with a new name. Now it's not going to be the ML platform, it's going to be the AI platform. Or it's going to be my company GPT platform, something. So that's one problem. I see some of you are nodding. Um, the other problem is there's a platform already. Like, are you building a platform on top of a platform on top of a platform? How stable is that going to be? So really, what is it you want? Figure out what you want. This is really tiny. Uh, but do you want to empower your current ways of working, like Carl was mentioning to a degree, with GitHub Copilot or Copilot for 365, or the Garth is going to mention JetBrains cool stuff in a minute? Um, or do you want to empower new ways of working? Like, extending into your own code base, doing, um, doing advanced stuff, building your own co-pilots, what have you? Um, or do you want to empower your customers? Do you want to build new solutions based on AI? Um, take all the Azure stuff or someone else's. Um, I think our, our competitors are racing to build equally great stuff. So in two years' time, it's going to be AI all over the place. And the other thing is you may have, I mean, what's empowered really? We hear about this all the time. And um, I think Microsoft's mission is something about empowering everybody on the planet to achieve more. Uh, but nobody really talks about what empowerment means. It's like we implicitly know what being empowered is. And I don't think you know. So, so my definition of empowered, helped a little bit from someone, is to be empowered is to be part of a team which, as a team, has the appropriate skills, authority, and experience, and whose sole focus is to get the whole job done. So your entire team needs to be the entire team. I'm not empowered if I ask, have to ask permission from security or compliance. I'm not empowered if I need to rubber stamp a release from someone in operations. So really what you have to do is to evolve the organization into some kind of feature th team thingy, instead of having things completely separate. So there's the UI team, there's the data team, there's the API team, and so on, right? Um, so from a DevOps perspective, it used to be developers, IT operations, QA, InfoSec. 
Now you might say, well, isn't DevOps about DevOps and IT? It was always about security. It was always about quality. Um, it was just, it was coined and I mean, somebody had too much to drink at a conference or something. So that's why it became DevOps. But now you have to extend that team with data scientists, prompt engineers, and possibly, ooh, business people, the people who actually know what we need to build. Maybe they should be part of the team instead of be someone that we don't talk to. So um, you know how Scrum and Safe solved that, right? So let's shield the developers from the business people. Let's make sure that we control what to build. Let's hire a product owner and put him in between the people who need to build stuff and the business. Do they need to be technically skilled? Mm, they need to have project management skills. Like, okay, where in Agile is project management? It doesn't exist. So, um, yeah. Sometimes I say my talks are usually unsafe. Um, so. <laughs> All right, so, if you want to empower your current ways of working, saying buy is triple equals easy. It's easy to buy stuff. Um, Carl already showed you what to buy. So, um, but the thing is, you have to make it easy to do it right. If you don't make it easy to do it right, you know what's going to happen? This is what's going to happen. People will put production code and customer data into ChatGPT with the sort of excuse, it'll be fine. It's not critical data. Nobody will notice. And maybe nobody will notice. But if somebody finds out, you're completely F plus five characters, All right? So the thing is, and it's the same thing with that or OneDrive or whatever thing, if you're preventing people from doing things in an easy, compliant, right way, they will find pitfalls and holes and do things. And talking to customers over the past, what, year or so of this AI revolution, um, this is what I hear all the time. Have you tried Copilot? No, but I tried putting it in ChatGPT and it works just fine. Like, okay, right. It's, um, it doesn't matter. People don't care about compliance, right? But, and if you don't help them, th things are gonna go e everywhere and somebody's gonna put in a, uh, a, some connector on, on something that looks like OpenAI and they're gonna put stuff in there and now they're gonna sample your data and get it all in there. And um, I'm pretty sure Cambridge Analytics is ready to receive it all, right? So, um, <clears throat> and then you might be saying, well, it's, that's easy for you to say. You just buy it, right? Um, and I'm, we're selling the licenses. So yeah, I, I'm saying that. But to a degree, I would say, well, if you don't know, yeah, well, I, I wrote something here. But the problem is, um, if you try to build it yourself, so we've you probably figured out, some of you, that um, you can get an extension for VS Code that allows you to plug in ChatGPT directly instead of using the, the Copilot or GitHub Copilot one. Um, and it works kind of okay, but now you're not in control anymore. Um, and people will do these things. But if you say, well, we don't want that, we want control of our data, we're gonna stand up our own instance of Azure Open AI, and we're gonna do this ourselves. Chances are, you're gonna be that 80% project. Guarantees, really, right? You're just gonna have, we're gonna build that, and then you're gonna come out in eight months time, you've seen it on LinkedIn already, we built this GPT thing, what can it do? Same as GitHub Copilot, but now we're in control. Mm-hmm, okay, and you paid a lot for it, now you're maintaining it, you have to keep up with the feature set, all that, just give up, all right? This is a commodity these days. GitHub Copilot, even though it's one of the newest and shiniest products, it's already becoming a commodity. It's supposed to be something we all have. And the other thing is, if you do it this way, it's a quote from a guy from Netflix, it's not my problem I'm renting. Like if it doesn't work, they will take care of it. Carl's team will make sure they, it works, right? Okay. So the other bit is, uh, what if I need to empower new ways of working? Um, we're sort of back to changing the organization bit for a while, but then there's also tools here. So there's things like Copilot Studio, but it's a little more intermediate. You have to configure it, you have to do more. Um, but there's also tools there to extend that, do things. I'm not saying you, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't build every, your new own thing from scratch. 
I'm saying, please don't start there. Like, give this a shot. Figure out if that can work for you. And if it can't, come talk to us. Maybe we want to fix it. And if, if we can't fix it, build your own. Fine, but now you have an informed decision. And finally, if you want to empower your customers, you have to build it from scratch. And that's hard, definitely. Even though we will say, well, we have all the tools available for you, sure, but it's still hard. And we haven't even trained the people who are able to do this stuff, right? So, so it's, it's a long way. So you might be thinking, well, back to that platform thing. So if I need to do this and this is hard, certainly I will need to build a platform to do that, right? Are you thinking that? Yeah, maybe not. I'm, I'm losing all of you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, if you build a platform to build a product before you build a product, that's called premature optimization. And who said that? The quote thing. Any computers? Thank you. It's always you. <laughs> right. Yeah, so premature optimization is definitely the root of all evil. Um, and I, I think I deliberately put quotes in here that are all from the 70s and 60s. This is not new stuff, right? This has been true all along. But all the managers we hire from CBLs and elsewhere, they have not been trained in this stuff. And it's really, really sad. Um, you can't consolidate something which doesn't exist yet. So if you want to have the economies of scale and say, well, what if there are commonalities here? And you hire enterprise architects to figure out that there are things that things have in common so we can build a platform for it. And it turns out the only thing they have in common is they all run on the bloody platform. It's the only thing, right? Um, third thing, you're all different, right? Do you remember Brian? There's one guy that's like, I'm not, but you're all different, right? All the products you're building are different. You have different requirements, different things you need, different target audiences, uh, different requirements for scale, everything. If you all put that on the same platform, all you have is one version. And I'm just seeing it almost daily. And so, um, so this is what your new platform will turn out to be, right? The thing is, a platform is a set of tools the IT organization makes for itself. It has no intrinsic value. It kind of has no value at all. So um, you may want to still have a platform later, but not, not that's the first thing. Usually I say I'm old enough to quote myself, so, um, but um, the thing is I figure out that most of our products, calls and Goths as well and all that, they work pretty well when they come out of engineering. Have you noticed that? Like if, you, if you're using it yourself on your own PC or your own machine or whatever, it's like, it's really fine. But when they hit the IT department, they suddenly stop working. And you have customers who are like, um, yeah, can you record this team's meeting? Yeah, it's not allowed. Like, what? Why? Um, because you can't store the data in... in... Okay, so... Um, so there's a lot of things going on like that, and, and you have to figure out, if you hand out the new shiny tools to the IT department, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take them and then they call them like, oh, my thing, precious, this is my thing. I'm going to make sure that nobody screws it up. But in that process, they make sure that nobody can use it for what it was designed for. So what then? So first of all, like I said, we have to have a strategy. We have to figure out what it is we're trying to do, what are we trying to build. And with those three pillars in terms of who you want to empower, it's maybe not one strategy, it poss possibly is three or more. The other thing is, you have to have a priority. You have to decide this is something we do. So how many of you are working on more than one product or project? It's almost all of you. Right? So, you're spending a lot of time in meetings and coordination and saying, well, we have to handle that product as well and that product as well, and Tuesdays we're doing that. Turns out, the best way to fail at inventing something is to make it somebody else's part-time job. Back to the being empowered as a team, 
That team needs to have one feature, one job, that's what they do. It's not supporting all the other things. You can't innovate and maintain in the same clock cycle. And split brain and context switching, and it just sucks, right? Um, on average, it takes, I think I've read something between 30 and 60 minutes for a developer to context switch from one task to another. So if you're scheduling meetings with a 30 minute gap, thinking, well, you've got four 30 minute gaps here, why haven't you put in two hours of work? Because I spent 120 minutes on context switching. Everything is lost. Does this uh, count for managers as well? Um, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that managers are even capable of context switching. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, I, mean, it, it, I mean, as a human, if you're knee deep in doing something and you're interrupted and you have to take a decision to do something else, it, it certainly accounts for managers as well. Um, so, what we need to do all in all to sum this up, I think, is to get the tools in the hands of your people. Figure out what kind of things do they need. Well, if they're running it on our cloud, they need an Azure subscription, but not only that, they need permissions on it, right? Not something with a, you can have a resource group with contributor access and please call if you need more. <laughs> um, so, um, and you need the other tools, right? Also, we really have to find a way to trust your people. How many of you got out of bed this morning thinking, I'm gonna go to work and I'm gonna fuck shit up. I'm gonna destroy my business. I'm gonna do something so vile that they're gonna fire me. None of you did that, right? We all came to work with the express intent of doing great stuff. Now, then the IT department and other things and meetings are preventing us from doing great stuff, but we're still kind of optimistic. Um, even though there's, um, yeah, there's a t-shirt in my case that's, uh, that I'm putting on tonight, which says, optimism is lack of information. Um, but that's about the end of the world and other things. So, um, yeah. Uh, but you have to trust your people and you have to find a way to trust your people. So, um, and maybe there's a trust but verify and some other things in there. Um, but, but if you can't figure that out, if you continuously tr believe that when people make a mistake, it was intentional, you're not going to innovate anywhere. You're just going to scare the shit out of people. So when you trust them and you give them the tools, you have to let them do their magic. So that feature team, let them do their magic. And let it simmer possibly in a cauldron somewhere. So, um, and then possibly in a year or more, try to find commonalities, create savings from consolidation, building a platform, figuring out, okay, we deployed five different AI stacks on Azure OpenAI, maybe they should use the same instance. Maybe, but it's kind of pay as you go, so does it really matter? Um, but maybe. Okay, so uh, a penultimate note on this. You have to build small things that work and get them to production. I think we call that MVPs somewhere, right? But it turns out that they never get to production. We're using that as POCs or proofs of concept or something. And at the same time, we're doing it still, because, um, you know, uh, POC really doesn't stand for proof of concept, right? Do you know what it stands for? It stands for production on completion. Because that's what always happens. Right? You show the POC to the manager and like, yeah, I want that in production. Like, it's not ready. We haven't considered security and we, we forgot about shifting left and all that. I want it in production. So, um, so you have to figure out to build something that's compliant and secure, possibly with some tools, um, and then get that to production. Because there's another old law from the 70s. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. Conversely, 
The inverse proposition also appears to be true. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be made to work. You have to start over, beginning with a working simple system. Vurderingssystemet. Eindomsskattesystemet. Like all the government systems, this is the reason all the government systems fail and are incredibly expensive. And it's not just government, right? It's, it's all of them. And you read that daily in the paper, like this is as many years as these things were delayed. And the reason they're delayed is because they didn't put anything into production. What they did was, we're going to have 12,000 pages of documentation that we're going to spend five years on writing, and then we're going to hire a big team to build the entire thing. And we're not going to put it into production unless it's completely perfect. But by the way, we're not going to run any automated tests. Right. And because I have a penultimate note, I can also have a final note. So, I found this uh, on, a, on an internet forum, um, just a, a comment on, on AI and, and why we're using it. So I'm just going to leave you with this. I'm going to try to read it out aloud. Um, but uh, it says, for decades we've been saying AI will come along and it will take over menial work, like simple boring tasks. And it will take over uh, releasing us humans to do more creative work that is more fun. That was the promise of AI, kind of, or something we were told. But it seems that AI has moved into the creative space. And it's just leaving more menial and mind-numbing stuff for humans to do. Except maybe pull request comments. <laughs> so why do we need AI-generated videos? or deep fakes. Like, why not leave that to somebody who is actually creative and use AI to do the menial frame-by-frame -frame touching up of remastering old videos? I know we're kind of doing that. I just released Alien like that. So, um, why are we letting AI write stories for the press or for books? Surely that is the purview of humans. Shouldn't the AI be checking the spelling or grammar before stories are posted? Shouldn't AI and automation be doing the menial tasks in the production line, freeing us humans to do the interesting stuff? It's because of these menial tasks that are also uninteresting to program, or is it because of that? Or is it because they're hard to get 100% accurate? It is more fun to get the AI to do more some squiggly lines. You can see doing something quickly, and it comes up with pretty pictures. It is more fun to get it to write an article or a story than get it to recognize a widget on a production and reject those defects. So even though Preben was touching on that, it seems like we completely forgot that was kind of the idea of recognizing pictures. It was not generating funny cats. So is AI pandering to the programmers of the AI and their founders, not to the potential users, and where it makes most sense? We people want short, sharp, endorphin high to instant gratification, not the hard slog to actually do something useful. Just a little food for thought. So um, with that, thank you for your time.